I'm David Adger, Professor of Linguistics at Queen Mary University of London, and I'm a Fellow of the British Academy. One of the sections of the British Academy is dedicated to linguistics and philology, and I'm a linguist. Linguistics is the systematic study of all aspects of human language, and I've written a brief blog about it elsewhere on the British Academy website you can have a look at if you like. My own particular area within linguistics is syntax. So I'm a syntactician. Worse, I'm a theoretical syntactician, which as you can imagine is not something I admit to at parties. What I'd like to do in this 10 minute talk, however, is explain what syntax as an area of study is, why I find it important and fascinating, and why I think it's central to what it means to be human. And most academics have a personal story about why they became interested in the area that then becomes their life's work. And like many, for me, it all started with a book. But the book wasn't by Chomsky or de Saussure or Sapper. It was by the science fiction author, poet, and essayist, Ursula Le Guin. And it was called A Wizard of Earthsea. I was around about 10, I think, when I read it. I borrowed it from my local authority library in Glenrothes in Scotland, where I grew up. A Wizard of Earthsea is a story of foolishness, of bravery, and it's about facing your demons. And I still love it as a story, but it also set me on my own intellectual journey into linguistics. It's set in a world where wizards control reality through words. Le Guin described a kind of first language, what in the books is called the language of the making, which in the mythology of Earthsea, is the language that was used to actually create all the things in the world. It's a language that's spoken by dragons and that wizards use to cast their spells. So the hero of our story, Ged, as part of his magical education, is sent to a windy, isolated tower on Roke, an island in the center of Le Guin's Earthsea. The tower is the home of a wizard, Kurem Karmeruk, who teaches the language of the making. There, Ged learns name after name in this language. Each plant and all of its leaves and sepals and stamens, each animal and all their scales, feathers and fangs. Kurem Karmeruk teaches his students that to work magic on something, you need to know the name, not just of that thing, but all of its parts and their parts and their parts. So to enchant the sea, Ged needed to know not just the name of the sea in the language of the making, but also the names of each gully and inlet, each reef and trench, each whirlpool, channel, shallows and swell, down to the name of the foam on a single wave that appears momentarily. So when I was 10, I found this thought quite fascinating because it's highly paradoxical. So how infinitesimal do you need to go before there just are no more names? And how particular do you need to be? A wave on the sea appears just once for a moment in time, and the foam on that wave is also unique and momentary. So no language could really have all the words to name every iota of existence. How could a language capture the numberless things and unending possibilities of the world? So I was captivated by this question when I was a young boy, and to be honest, I still am. Because although Le Guin's language of the making is mythical, human language itself does actually have this almost mystical power. It can describe the infinite particularity of the world as we perceive it. I mean, it allows me to talk about the foam that I saw on a wave, the first one that tickled my bare toes on a beach in Weems in Scotland on my 10th birthday. And I've just described that, right? I've just picked that out of my history. And I don't do this by giving a unique name to that foam, like Ged might have been able to do. I do it through the power to combine words into larger phrases and to create new meanings out of old ones. And that's fundamentally what syntax is. Now, the vastness of any language is quite astounding. I opened my recent book by asking readers to make up a sentence, 
maybe one that's 15, 20 words long, and then to search for that exact sentence on the internet by putting it in inverted commas and putting it into a search engine. And quite astoundingly, and I invite you to try this, whenever you do this, you can almost never find that sentence. So virtually every sentence we spontaneously speak is new. We create them on the fly to serve the purposes that we need them to serve. Yet at the same time, the sentences of our languages are intricately structured. You can't just put words anywhere you like and have the sentence mean what you want it to mean. How the words appear in a sentence contributes to how the meaning of that sentence is built up. So take a really simple three word sentence like Lily bit Anson. So Lily's my cat and Anson's my partner. So now you know what I'm claiming happened. But I can take these exact same words and say Anson bit Lily, same words, but totally different meaning. So how does that actually work? And of course, if I try to order those same words as bit Lily Anson, well, that's not a good sentence of English with an associated meaning. Why not? It would be in another language like Scottish Gaelic, where it would mean that Lily bit Anson, or Malagasy, where it would mean that Anson bit Lily. Now that was with a three word sentence. As you can imagine, these how and why questions I just asked get more and more complex as we look at more and more complex sentences. And then of course we have thousands of languages, both spoken languages and sign languages to look at and compare. All languages ever studied have a syntactic structure that connects the meanings pretty systematically with the ways the sentences are expressed. And that syntactic structure is, as far as we know, given all of the work that's been going on in linguistics for the last decades and centuries, is always characterized by hierarchy. Larger phrases are built up by smaller ones. So even in something as simple as Lily bit Anson, all the evidence points to the fact that the words bit and Anson are a kind of coherent subpart of that whole sentence, one smaller phrase inside a larger phrase. There's evidence from psychological experiments and from neuroscience that our brains act in a way that's sensitive to this structure, but notice that the structure isn't something you can hear or see directly. Languages aren't pronounced or signed in a way that makes this hierarchical structure obvious. So this opens up new mysteries. So how do little babies across the world, as they learn the syntax of their languages, end up over and over again with an invisible hierarchy, but a hierarchy that they never experience? So one way of thinking about the answer to this question is that sentences are like many other aspects of the world. They are self-similar structures. So we find self-similar structures throughout nature. So if you imagine when a river spreads out into a delta, it branches and then each branch branches again, recreating the same structure. And then that branch can branch again until it hits the sea. Similarly, when you take in a breath, it flows into your lungs through tubes, one branching to the left and one branching to the right, and there each tube branches again, and those then branch again, again, creating a sort of self-similar structure inside your lungs that totally underpins your life. And we don't find self-similarity just in the natural world. The internet has organized itself in the same way, we have larger hubs connecting to smaller hubs and these connect to yet smaller ones and so on and so on until you get to your laptop or your phone. And it seems, as far as we can work out, that the syntax of human languages is also organized by this same principle of self-similarity. Each phrase in a large complex sentence branches into smaller phrases and then these branch again and again and again until they end up in words. So whether this property of self-similarity comes from our biology or from more general laws about how matter or information organizes itself across time is not known. 
it's an open debate, actually. However, it does seem to be that it's this self-similarity that is responsible for the incredible creativity of language. So I'm going to give you a lovely example, which is possessive structures. Now, in English, you can refer to the part of my cat, Lily, that is her tail by saying, David's cat's tail. This is a phrase that picks out a particular tail. And inside that phrase, there is another phrase saying who the tail belongs to. That phrase, David's cat, is itself a complex phrase that picks out a cat and has inside it another element that tells you who the cat belongs to, David. So in this case, the element's simple, just a single word. But of course, it could be more complex, as in the current presenter's cat's tail or the person in this video's cat's tail. So you can see the idea of self-similarity very clearly here. The syntax of English allows you to put in a noun phrase like David's cat into or inside a larger noun phrase to make David's cat's tail. In fact, you could go totally crazy and say things like David's neighbors, mother's friends, cat's tails, tips, color is black. Now you kind of lose track of the meaning as it's just too much to remember, but the syntax of that sentence is perfect. It's this kind of self-similarity, in fact, that leads to human languages having such richness in what they can express, as I just showed you. But there's a kind of deep mystery, even with this incredibly simple example. If we look across many, many, many different languages, we find that languages split into two groups as far as possessors go. We have those like English or Mandarin or Gaelic or whatever that allow you to have as many possessors as you like in the way that we've just seen. And we have another set like Standard German or the Amazonian language Piraha, which apparently allow just one possessor in this kind of structure. Now, weirdly, we never find languages where you can have, say, just two possessors as a maximum. So this would be a language where you could say David's cat and David's cat's tail, but it would be impossible to say David's cat's tail's tip. Why is that? Why is it that such languages don't exist? Why do we only find two groups of languages? Now, people who've looked at what adults say to children for learning languages have found that adults hardly ever say more than two possessors. Although you can have three or four or more, as you've just seen, people just don't talk like that. So what little babies hear as they acquire their languages is just a maximum of two possessors. Yet, no language we know of works like this. Children generalize to an unbounded number of possessors in the syntax of their language, even though they may never hear more than two. This is especially mysterious, as we know from psychological experiments that even incredibly young babies, uh, babies like, you know, weeks old, have this kind of innate capacity, which psychologists call subitization, that allows them to detect things that come in very small numbers, like two or three. So we know babies can do this. We know babies only hear two possessors, English speaking babies, for example, and yet none of them use their capacity for recognizing very small numbers to create a grammar for possessors that says you can just have two. No human in the world, apparently, does this. So why does no human use that capacity to learn possessor syntax? So I'm going to leave you with that question. Uh, but I just wanted to say this, mysteries like this that make syntax so endlessly interesting. I've given you a tiny, tiny case. But as you can imagine, the, you, know, you look at every language in the world, all of which have incredibly different syntax. There's a lot of mysteries out there. Words are fascinating. They're fascinating little boxes of meaning and culture and grammar all wrapped up like little presents. And so they are fascinating aspects of linguistics. But for me, syntax is where the magic happens.